All right. Farewell, Mao. See you. Bye. See you. Uh, All you. right. Okay. All right. The next session is going to be the final session of this symposium. It's been a really incredible journey. And I think this final session is going to be great as well. So we have a whole panel here and <clears throat> people can use their cameras, even though I'm not, if they want to, um, welcome everyone. I'll just introduce the facilitator, Kurt Jaimungal. So Kurt is a, a legend in the active ecosystem and has done incredible work with a variety of researchers and curious individuals in the space. So we could think of no one better to host this conversation and bring it all together. So Kurt, I'll pass it to you. You'll keep an eye on the live chat. Anyone can call it if they need any supports. Otherwise, thanks everybody for joining. And uh, we don't see you yet, Kurt, but... Yeah, I, it would it be all right if I left and then came right oh, yeah. back for whatever reason my camera's not working. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, I'll be right back in about 25 seconds. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we will get started in just a second. Hmm. so odd i apologize for that okay well you can hear my voice at least yep just give me a moment i apologize boy okay well well we'll do what we can okay so you all can't see me, but that's all right. So we have this all-star panel here today, which to me means my invitation must have been a mistake, but I'll take it. Thank you to the Active Inference Institute, and I'll go around this virtual Zoom table and introduce everyone briefly. Carl Friston is the Welcome Pr Principal Research Fellow and Scientific Director at the Welcome Trust Center for Neuroimaging and Professor of Neurology at University College London. He's also the chief scientist at Versus. Anna Lempke is chief of the Stanford Addiction Medical, sorry, Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic at Stanford University. Her popular books include Drug Dealer, MD, and Dopamine Nation. Raphael Kaufman is CTO of Digital Gaia and the on board, sorry, and is on the board of directors of the Active, Insti Active Inference Institute. Bert DeVries is a professor at Eindhoven University of Technology, where he directs the Bias Lab research team and also works with industry. Guillaume Dumas is an associate professor in computational psycho psychiatry of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Montreal and the director of the Precision Psychiatry and Social Physiology Laboratory in CHU Saint. -Saint Sorry, in, in the CHU St. Justine Research Center. He's also affiliated with MILA, or MILA, which is Quebec's Artificial Intelligence Institute and other art, science, and consciousness service initiatives. My name is Kurt Jamungo, and I use, them, I use my background in mathematical physics to analyze various theories of everything that are proposed. These include both the theoretical physics side of grand unification with gravity and dualities, other schemes, as well as attempting to understand what constitutes consciousness. You can find the podcast by typing in theories of everything onto YouTube or whatever podcast catcher you have. So my question to everyone, the initial question is, what have you been working on in the past few months and what excites you about it? We'll start with Bert. You seem to be smiling. And your name sounds like mine.
I'm going to... Okay, so, um, all right, so uh, my name is uh, Bertha Vries, and uh, yeah, I lead um, a lab uh, in, uh, in an ele electrical engineering department. And uh, so our lab is called Bias Lab, as you, as you mentioned. So we are interested in Bayesian inference in, in general, but more specifically in doing it as fast as possible. That, that, that has lots of applications uh, outside active inference, also in uh, yeah, for signal processing and other uh, control systems, but definitely, of course, also for active inference. So half our work uh, over the past few months, but even over the past few years, has been on developing a toolbox to support or to get as far as we can go with uh, trying to do real-time Bayesian inference or real-time free energy minimization and, uh, and trying it uh, in applications. Um, so that's that's the work that I, I, I try to lead a, a team of, uh, of PhD students who, who do the real work, of course. I, I walk around with a cup of coffee, but uh, that's what they have been working on. Great. And Professor Lemke, please. Yeah, well, what I've been working on in the last, um, I don't know, year or so, is spending a lot of time thinking about how it is that a faith framework, in particular surrender to a higher power, improves people's lives. And I've been really struggling to come up with um, a way of talking about this that is inclusive, thinking about it, talking about it. It gets to a kind of core piece of it that I'm interested in, which is not so much whether or not God exists and what the proof is or not of whether God exists, but really what, what is it that changes in people's lives when they undergo a spiritual transformation, when they surrender to a higher power? Why, why do their lives get better um, when they do get better? And um, I'm really new to the active inference world. Daniel Friedman is the one who's introduced me to these ideas. I'm, I'm really excited about the ways in which the whole active inference model um, might help me at least think about what's going on there. And um, so, so that's what I'm that's what I'm working on. It's a little weird, but uh, that's what I'm interested in. Great, Professor Friston. You're muted. Yes, that's going to be the title of my next book, Carl, You're on Mute. I think that's a retro from the COVID era, possibly the future. Um, I, I I generally work on what I'm told to work on, so I'm just been trying to list uh, what I've been working on um, in the past few months. Interestingly, um, it actually starts with um, Daniel Friedman and his um, fascination with, um, along with Axel Constant for evolutionary explanations um, speak to many of the scale free issues that we've been hearing about um in the prior session um so that's what i was working on really a scale free approach to understanding temporary nested processes as free energy minimizing processes as a kind of active inference and how that would lead to a variational synthesis of evolution and then I was told to work on belief sharing by Mao and colleagues at Versus um, and um, worked on that in the context of synthetic language and to try to um, establish a really simple proof of principle that communication was an emergent property of any free ensemble free energy minimizing system. Um, and uh, just to open brackets, just to make the observation, it struck me time and time again uh, during the session today how important communication is. Um, you know, whether we're talking about Bert's um, passing messages or responding to, uh, you know, you've got a new post area, or we're talking about the kind of communication um, that Mao was talking about, well, that everybody's been talking about. It does seem to be a really, uh, and indeed the guy, the guy. Um, notion of uh, over connectivity and too much communication or the wrong kind of communication um it does strike me that that's quite central uh to, to a lot to the, the both the theme of the um the, the workshop um and um the specific uh, presentations that we've heard um and then uh, in the past few weeks working on stuff i think that bert would be um 
um, more interested in, which is um, fast and frugal um, message passing schemes that um, enable the evaluation of the expected free energy not to suffer from uh, the limitations imposed by deep tree searches. So um, possibly uh, Ashwin has, has spoken about this earlier on, but um, you're using ideas from dynamic programming backwards induction to try and um, take the pressure off the, the message passing to get fast and efficient uh, evaluations of the expected free energy in sort of um, sort of single unit, uh, sort, of, sort of single agent uh, active inference. What have I been doing this week? Can't remember. <laughs> that, that's what I've been doing. Great. Raphael Kaufman, please. Just a moment. Can, can everyone else hear? Okay. What about now? Yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's contagious, I think. Uh, no, so I've also been drinking a lot of coffee as I've been uh, caring for my now nine month old daughter. So, uh, congratulations. Thank you. So aside from sleep deprivation, what I've been doing is um, uh, I, I told you guys about this in the, in the session earlier today, but uh, in a nutshell, we've been working on what we call the the, the Gaia protocol uh, or the Gaia network, which is this uh, this um, open approach for, for building a uh, common, uh, common engine, you can think of it as a common runtime. And uh, in a common uh, language for, for with the building blocks of, of shared decision making, um, in the um, in the context of what well, the med crisis and, and uh, getting to getting to a set of of building blocks for decision making that don't kill us all. So that's that's kind of it. And Raphael, how many how much coffee is a lot of coffee? Well, it's espresso, so I don't think it's quite comparable to like American coffee. All right. And Guillaume Dumas, please. Uh, yes, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, so in the context of action inference, uh, I have mostly focused on, uh, well, the two big topic of my lab, so uh, precision psychiatry and social physiology. So on the precision psychiatry side, uh, Nick Boyton presented earlier in this symposium our work on trying to model theory of mind to being able to evaluate uh, through digital phenotyping the level of sophistication of interaction in patients with neurodevelopmental disorders. And that connects with also our uh, interest in the social mind and how we can uh, connect our understanding of how we deal with other people, but with also ourselves. And so that connect with other work at the Mila with the deep learning architecture with higher order um, function in humans, uh, where we're trying to combine different theories of consciousness, such as global neural workspace and attention schema theory. And in the context of attention schema theory, there is this kind of recycling of self and other mechanisms. So that's one uh, big uh, work. And on the other side, uh, I'm very interested also in uh, multi-agent uh, systems. And so uh, with uh, Nathalie Cassel, who's gonna join us uh, soon, uh, we've been working on creativity and the emergence of cultural norms in multi-agent systems uh, with the idea of applying that to climate action and also a, a new project that is starting here with the uh, uh, NFRF, of, uh, a big Canadian project on indigenous knowledge and how we can think about new narrative around AI and typically a, a less solipsistic and individualistic way of dealing with AI. So that's the, the two main uh, field of mm -hmm. research. Can you explain what you mean by less solipsistic, less solip, oh, geez, Louise, solipsistic. less solipsistic when it comes uh, to AI? The, the Californian view of AI, because uh, the narrative is mainly driven by uh, uh, U.S. and California right now tends to circle around optimization, profit. I mean, even OpenAI states that uh, AGI is about optimizing 
profitable human task. They they put like uh, profitable in their definitions. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the case of indigenous uh, systems of knowledge, we are more talking about community uh, sustainability, and uh, the view already only in the application is less individualistic, but also in the cognitive science point of view, we we have like the, the hardcore computationism that would say uh, the brain is just like a computer in a very restrictive sense. And so uh, AI, like typically the, those transformers uh, that are massively used right now uh, are kind of like brain in a vat uh, in a very silicon uh, sense. While we are embodied systems that are uh, constituted by our interaction with others, and so, like in a way, how we can think about artificial intelligence in this kind of more co-constitutive way and through a, a developmental and cultural lens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, speaking of the brain as a computer, we frequently frequently hear in these circles the brain as a predictive machine. So. Where does this, the quote unquote brain as a predictive machine, have its limits? And also, is that to be interpreted as implying conscious experience is a predictive machine as well? Okay, and if not, why not? So I think, Carl, you'd be a great person to start this off and then we'll go around the table again. Yeah, I, I was just mindful of Mao's uh, presentation, the past half hour, um, and the notion of temporal thickness. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that's got a lot to do with the necessary conditions for the kind of consciousness I'm, I'm guessing you're referring to, you know, that freedom from the moment. Um, and if one reads prediction in its sort of folk psychological or protensive or protention um, um, nature in terms of being able to predict what will happen in the future, I think that the... Um, that's that that's going to be a sort of uh, a key bright line between things that um do not possess a certain kind of um sentience and things that do um and that bright line just rests basically upon um well from the perspective of active inference having a generative model that includes the consequences of your own actions in the future so just by having consequences you're now talking about um, the future and the cause, the, the consequences um, in the future now become random variables. Therefore, you have to infer them, which leads you directly to the notion of planning as inference, which means that bright line is just the difference between things that plan and do not plan. Um, and um, I would guess that that's where you probably want to start in terms of foregrounding the role of prediction um, as being. Uh, uh, an aspect of self-organization and its sort of reading under active inference that characterizes conscious things from uh, non-conscious things, namely the ability to plan. Does that make sense? Yeah. I have follow-up questions. We'll get to them at some point. But for now, Anna, do you have do you have any comments on that? And and Bert as well. Afterward. Um. Well, you know, I'm I'm new to this field, so I'm just familiarizing myself even with the language. But I, I can respond to uh, the question, the brain is a predictive machine in terms of the work that I do clinically and the kind of psychopathology that I see. When I'm working with patients, um, you know, we, I work primarily with narratives, the stories that they tell about their lives. And one of the recurring themes I've seen through my work is that when patients tell stories in which they are perpetually the victims of other people's actions or the world, they tend to then, um, that tends to be a predictive model for them so that they will then go out into the world and unconsciously create scenarios which will perpetuate their victimhood. And that part oh. of getting into wellness is to stop seeing themselves as entirely the victim of other people or circumstance instead begin to appreciate um, what they contribute to their life problems. So I guess when I think of the limits of the brain as a predictive machine, I think in some ways, uh, one of the big limits is that it's a very powerful predictive machine that actually mm. allows us to subsequently shape uh, 
what actually happens to us and or our perceptions of what happens to us, which then can perpetuate um, a false narrative. And I, I, I'll just give one small example from my own life. I've had um, you know, my conflicts with my mother and one of my beefs about her is that she's a very poor communicator and that whenever I email her, I either get a cryptic response or no response at all and it drives me crazy. And about five years ago, she sent uh, an email, asked me some questions. I wrote her back and responded. And it was clear to me um, that that required yet a response from her, which I never got. And that then perpetuated my narrative about her as a very poor communicator and many other negative things. And then about three months after I sent that email, I found the email in my draft in, in my draft box. So I had never actually responded mm. to my email. I hadn't actually sent the email. And that was for me um, just a, you know, a personal, uh, wonderful example of the ways in which uh, we can, our actions can actually um, be manipulated to uh, support our models uh, and perpetuate falsehoods about uh, the world that we live in. Right. And I I have a quick question, Bert, just for Anna before we get to you. So you use the word narrative there. How are you defining the word narrative? Is it the same as model? Is it a sequence of events? Like what is the specific definition of narrative? You know, I never really thought about it in those terms, but when I talk about narrative, I'm talking about um the stories that people tell about their lives, because that's sort of my data. Um and and also about models, because what, what I've discovered about self-narrative is it's not just a way to organize the past. It also becomes a roadmap for the future. That's the language that I use, but I see it maps very nicely onto your all's language of modeling the world. I see. Professor DeVries, please. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's clear that uh, the ability to predict is, is, is the essence of uh, intelligent decision making. Um, yeah, I have a different background, right? I'm not a psychiatrist, so I think about these things in different way. The thing that, that I think about when I think about prediction is I, I would assume that it brain predicts far ahead that things get less accurate, right? If I predict that I want to go three quarters around a roundabout, I don't care about the centimeter where my car goes when I'm around there. I just want to get in, in, in the right lane. Um, and I would assume that the brain doesn't take much, it takes less computations if you care about things less precisely. But that's very hard in a computer. We have, this is what uh, kind of kills us in, our, in, in, I think, in our current uh, way of implementing active inference. When we want to predict a deep half, uh, we don't care about the accuracy, but we don't know how to do it much cheaper when things are less accurate. And uh, so that's still a, that's a problem that we, uh, uh, that we need to be working on. Um, it, it, might be an, uh, it might be a key to building or to scaling up active inference agents. If we can actually compute messages that we want to know that we, that we don't care about if they are less precise, that we also spend much less computation on them. Thank you. Now, Professor Kaufman. Um, I am not a professor, but I'll answer anyway. <laughs> uh, they just call me Rafa, Rafa. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's uh, so many really interesting avenues here, and it's not often that I get the the the, the pleasure of discussing this kind of stuff with uh, with this uh, kind of diverse crowd. But I do. I mean, I've been interested in uh, in these questions uh, for for a pretty long time, and I. I uh, I think what comes to mind is like how how active inference as a lens, uh, for instance, it enables us to 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 get another sense of what uh, non dualist views on consciousness uh, are saying when they when they uh, get us experientially to to notice the difference between what we actually perceive and what we're, we're, between the different various different. Uh, uh, processes or things that are going on in our in our head and our tendency to like lump them all together in, into the same. Okay, this is this is my this is my experience that that I'm immersed in. Um, 
So noticing, being able to 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 uh, notice the difference between the 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 the, the process of perceiving and act and and acting and to what extent it's automated and the narrative or the various narratives that are going on uh uh in parallel in my head whether i'm aware of them or not and uh and our ability to 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 just put kind of seemingly arbitrary meta levels on top of it to to try to make sense of it all and to to force uh force that experience of having multiple narratives and multiple framings Going on at the same time makes uh, makes sense of that experience in a in a um, in a way that aligns with our presuppositions about about how things are. So um, I, I think that's super interesting. And also, I also want to highlight that uh, like this this view of consciousness as being kind of uh, defined by having a narrative uh, or an internal model that's about self, or that at least. Uh, is about self and that leads as as Carl said to the planning as inference uh that's actually like super defl deflationary in a way that that people are not uh not used to thinking about it and uh and so it's an exciting it's opening the doors to all the sorts of exciting interdisciplinary conversations to be had on the basis of at least I feel like better uh less talking past each other than we've ever had so I'm excited about that Aaron how is it that you're using the word deflationary there? Carl, I remember uh, I asked you about that when we had our podcast together. But Raphael, it's a similar question. So you said deflationary view when we have narratives of self. Do you mean well, that leads us to something that consciousness is much more than? Sorry, much well, less than? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, not necessarily much less than in the in the uh, subjective sense, but it's uh, perhaps much le much less than in the in the scientific sense so uh one example of like one not saying exactly that but but maybe something close to what uh daniel dennett calls heterophenomenology which is basically the the statement that the the sum of what one can say scientifically about consciousness is is um is equal to what can be can be uh what can be studied and uh, and modeled and theorized and communicated and learned and uh, agreed upon on the basis of objective data about what people, including you, but other, also other people say uh, about their experience, which, it, and of course, like what can be measured up neural correlates and whatever, which is not the same as our, not necessarily the same as our experience of our direct, what we think is our direct experience of being conscious, conscious right? So one way to look at it is that, uh, uh, is that, uh, the science of consciousness doesn't necessarily have to put the primacy on on people. For for instance, people saying they have qualia uh, that that we thought. In that sense, it's deflationary, right? It's um, yeah. You have to explain why people believe they have qualia, not why people have qualia, because it's not it's not necessarily a scientific truth that people have mm. qualia, right? Professor Dumas. Uh, yeah. So, well, on the limits of brain as predictive machine, well, we, sh we should be always careful to not move from uh, one uh, map territory fallacy to another one, for sure. So we need to be uh, uh, skeptics and avoid to reify the methods. And, well, the this world symposium show how this metaphor is super useful and, and fruitful. But um, I can see, like, two main uh limits or at least uh things where we should be careful so uh following what uh, uh professor lemke said like in psychiatry i think the the looping effects and uh, the way people picture themselves uh can be uh very unpredictable and so the the way uh we think about the brain as a predictive machine think prediction for uh, patients would have different signification of what we mean by pre uh, predictive machines in the context of active inference. And in general, also, like uh, the, I, I, I can see that certain uh, psychologists or anthropologists would have a, a big appeal all of a sudden for uh, active inference and pre energy principles, but taking the, the words uh, as uh, directly what they think the word mean well, it needs to be, we need to be careful in the way to communicate it. And typically, uh, following also uh, what Professor DeVries said about 
uh, predict prediction as being super important for decision making. I think like uh, um, uh, we should be careful about the the weirdness of uh, cognitive science and how uh, it doesn't necessarily expand to a non-Western educated uh, industrialized country where maybe the cultural value is not about optimization of your decision making or your uh, profit. And so that's the first thing where I think we should be careful. It's, it's more like a, a matter of how to communicate the theory. In that case, not necessarily a limit of the theory itself. But the, the second one is uh, about the, the equivalence or not with other frameworks. So like uh, uh, I can see how we, we had uh, Mao uh, Albassan talking about uh, category theory. And uh, I'm very curious about right now uh, among the different frameworks that are out there, how can we define what is equivalent or not with active inference uh, to be able to to see those limits. Uh, maybe we are leaving what happened with quantum mechanics in the in the early uh, uh, 20th century with different interpretation, with different tools to model quantum mechanics. And here with artificial intelligence and cognitive neuroscience, we have also all those frameworks. And uh, I think uh, the limitation would be then to not take this interpretation as the only one, but uh, try to have uh, a crosstalk and a differential uh, diagnosis of which one mm. is the best for explaining what. Okay, now my role is, is the moderator, but I, I would like you all to, to speak to one another. So I'm going to ask a question that will serve as, well, you each will speak on it, but as the other person is speaking, as sorry, as the other people are speaking, just think, okay. Is there a question that I have or is there a comment that I have? So the question is, what are some of the recent advancements or breakthroughs in your respective fields that you find particularly promising? And well, recent, let's say 2020 till now. So we'll start off with Raphael. You're smiling and you look yeah. like a champion. Oh, I, I was thinking, what is my field, right? Because I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're very much in the in the um, in the last mile of applying the the wonderful stuff that y'all come up with and uh, and uh, making it uh, useful on the ground. But so I'm I'm extraordinarily excited about research like what uh, what Bert is doing, and uh, uh, I feel like as uh, as Guillaume was saying, we're also starting to see some uh, some convergence on. Uh, on different um different ways to get to to the same uh at least to the same shape of answers and in some cases even to the same uh, the same uh results so like one example of this is uh work that uh um Chris, Chris Fields Carl and others have been doing on uh, on the the quantum uh uh basically explaining quantum information theory uh and uh and how it relates to 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 the free energy principle looking at the free energy principle as the as the classical limit of of quantum information theory and i don't pretend to to understand all of it but as somebody who has who is coming from a quantum physics background uh just uh uh being alive to see this this kind of convergence happening it, which as i mean as as uh, as Guillaume said, we know we've been at this at this business of like post classical. What's what the hell is going on for over a century now? And it's nice to to be at a time where again we're st we're, we're starting to talk less past each other. And that's that's from a theoretical perspective. From a practical perspective, I think just uh, just finding that we have all the building blocks to to uh, create uh, fast, interpretable. Um, um reliable and aligned um decision making systems which includes uh ai systems autonomous systems that have all those characteristics and that it turns out that all the things that the reinforcement learning and uh and deep net neural networks people thought were very hard or impossible or sort of in the realm of of what we can do uh lo looking at things from an active in inference lens and uh vice versa a lot of things that 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 uh active inference models have incorporated so far there turns out if you if you toss in a neural network approximator here 
um, and um, you know some borrow some other you know massively parallel computation techniques, uh, it also becomes feasible. So it's it's converging. Yeah, for me, it's what's remarkable is that there's so many domains of of what we thought was exclusively human or would be exclusively human for decades that in just the past couple of years robots or computers seem to be just as good if not exceeding us and i don't know if that's promising or worrisome but anyhow carl please if you don't mind answering the question and then we'll go anna then bert and then dumas well actually just reflecting upon your um one of your observations i think it's very difficult to identify one thing uh you know in a sense um what is impressive is the diversity of advances and applications um and i, I just say that because th that's what i was thinking you know over the past six hours just listening to your know, amazing presentation after presentation and just you know noting how diverse you know th th and yet there's this common thread this common commitment uh basically sating our curiosity and and using the the, the tools that naturalize that kind of sense making and curious behavior and communication um that inherit from sort of either maths or category theory or as, as rough um notes now quantum information theory but just to pick up on a couple of things which are relevant to this conversation so the work with chris fields um you know it sounds um lovely and exciting to bring quantum mechanics into um um active inference but that's not the move that i think chris is um, really wanting to champion the move i think is something that we've all been addressing in one way or another which is um leveraging the scale free aspects of these this principled uh, uh, approach to self organization and hopefully self organization to some kind of generalized synchrony um so that that's where the quantum information theory gets into the game it is scale free and indeed even go further and say it's completely background free and everything is constructed it's just uh, uh so i think that that's a lovely move um because when, once you've gone scale free you then start to ask deep questions about how you couple one scale to another scale and in a sense ecosystems is just that how do the you know the denizens of an ecosystem um how is it constitute how is it co-constructed what is the structure of it these are all questions about how one scale links to another scale so i think there have been lots of advances in, in that direction in many many different fronts um and you can read that either in terms of coupling different sort of spatial or um yeah spatial scales um but probably more importantly sort of temporal scales and you see that you know wh wherever you look um um you know, just come back to um what do you mean by a narrative um it is exactly mm -hmm. i think as i said it, it, it's just a a plan it's just a story but notice the story has a temporal aspect to it you know i have narratives about being a good person being a good father being a good scientist I also have narratives about you know i want my cup of coffee or i have to go look after the if i, I don't but ralph has to go look after the child um so yeah we've all got narratives at very very different time scales and of course if you're um yeah i just came back to bert's example of you know, i'm an autonomous vehicle and i'm sentient and we're five years into the future and i have to drive around the roundabout yeah what temporal scale and what kind of temporal course graining to define the narrative nested with narratives would be appropriate for that kind of situation um and um the uh, you know the, the the ensuing planning so um so to my uh, so a uh, short answer to your question i think there have been many many advances um they have um i think what they've had in common is basically transcending either different domains but in particular different scales of application i also agree um with the notion well another i think important and pragmatic advance um is something that bert mentioned which is democratization of this technology and i think ralph also hinted at you know this is the time you start using this for the for the, for the common good um, um 
So I think you know the things like um, RX Infer and PyMDP, and, uh, and I didn't know about the the Gaia project, uh, but it sounds as though there's been great advances there as well. So this kind of democratization, I think, is really important. This sort of socialization where everybody can play uh, and start to sort of um, not to talk past each other. I think that that's a that's a very important uh, a very important advance. And did you say the word scale invariance or scale independence? I said scale invariant. Um, I actually said scale free, and I shouldn't have done that. Um, I, I meant uh, um, I, I said scale uh, scale free. So the the idea that you can apply exactly the same mechanics and literally, for example, say from Bert's perspective, the same kind of message passing at different space time scales or um, at different levels in a hierarchical model. So I've actually got a question for Bert um, in terms of reactive message passing, because reactive means that you don't have to um, prescribe the scheduling, but you in, in addressing the problems or the issues that are entailed by um, having to specify the scheduling of talking or uh, of message passing, um, you, you're um, you're bound to deal with time, and in a scale invariant context or nested with nested scales, for example, you have to deal with the, tem uh, the separation of temporal scales. So. I, I think there's going to be a very important generic question, which technically Bert will be, have been thinking about furiously for the past few years. But I think implicitly we're all going to have to be addressing soon, which is the um, how do you put that the timing of your messages when you make a move or when you listen to a patient or um, 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 when you actually pass a message in on a factograph. Um, how does how are you going to how are we going to be able to put the separation of, of, of time scales into the architecture in a way that speaks to this uh, the scale invariance? You know the gear project, for example. How do you integrate um, live feed from traffic flow um, um, sensors with uh, fluctuations in the climate? You know these kinds of this kind of data comes at very, very different uh, temporal scales, and yet has to be assimilated and modeled, um, you know, it, it, in a way that is also, I think, has to pay, pay, you know, due courtesy to that separation of temporal scales. Bert, could you please recapitulate the question for the audience and then begin to answer it? Okay. Um... Yeah, the issue is if you ha if, if I mean active instance agents are, are nested agents and um, the higher levels supposed to operate on a larger temporal scale, but they should they are also working at a lower resolution. Right? If you if you look far ahead, you don't care as much about precision, not at the centimeter level. When I go around and around about, I don't care at the centimeter where I land, but if I'm but for the next few milliseconds, I do care about because it may mean the difference between getting in the ditch or not. So mm -hmm. um, I don't want to send, uh, so the higher level, I want to look very deep ahead, but I don't want to send every millisecond a message to go to, to look, let's say, um, a minute ahead because uh, so, so I need to space it out a lot, but then I may miss things. Um, so preferably you would just send inaccurate messages, but that only works if you actually have a method to also, let's say, use less uh, computational power to compute a less accurate message. And we're not good at that yet. Um, there, there, I think, I mean, the, what we are thinking about is there's a new field, or a new field, but there's a, a, a field called probabilistic numerics, where um, we are used in, in math to just compute everything very precisely or as precise as possible and, 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 and do not care about how much computation we spend on it. Um, so in probabilistic numerics, um, I, I, I hope we can leverage this for, uh, for message computations. Um, I would like to spend, let's say, proportionally less computational power on, uh, on the accuracy of a message. One way, Possibly it would be to consider a message a latent variable, 
that has an, an, an uncertainty by itself. Um, but I, I don't have a, a, a totally clear answer for, for Carl because we haven't solved that either. Um, but there, there is a problem in, let's say, what we do on our, I mean, our computers were so completely different from computers that, from, let's say, from the, um, from the, from the brain that, uh, yeah, um, we're spending, we're spending just too many computations on messages that in the end are very, very inaccurate. And, uh, and, th and that's a problem in, uh, in what we do on our computers currently. Um, yeah, so I don't know how we go. Be, I mean, what you want to do with this on the higher level, if you, you, you want to look maybe uh, um, 10 times farther ahead and spend about the same amount of computation on the lower level, that's sort of the uh, our goal. And uh, but, but we don't have an answer for that either at the moment. Mm -hmm. And and Anna, so please feel free to comment on or ask a question to anyone. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I you know, I don't I don't have uh, anything to contribute, unfortunately, to how computers work. But I can tell you that this idea of temporal scales is something that we face often in our work with patients. Um, for example, addicted patients are very focused on short-term rewards, and it's it's a fact. In fact their ability to control how they feel in the moment that is partially what drives the addiction. So when when I try to adopt your all's language of minimizing surprise or mi minimizing free entropy, that's one of the things that people are trying to do on a short-term time scale when they become addicted. So I have a young woman who is addicted to nitrous oxide, which has a very fast onset of intoxication over the order of seconds and a very fast offset. And she says that that's exactly what she likes about it because she's controlling it second by second. So when we work with patients to get them out of that short temporal horizon, we actually rely more and more on action and having them change something in their lives, namely abstain from their drug of choice for long enough to kind of completely reset uh, their brains and to allow them to see this longer temporal horizon. Because when they're chasing this short control, they're actually not able to see themselves in the, the longer narrative arc of their lives. So that's that what's that's what comes to mind for me. I don't think it's going to be helpful to people who are trying to build computers, but that's that's the kinds of interventions that I make with humans. I have a question about that. So you mentioned control in the short term, and you've also mentioned that you study the positive effects of having a higher power in your life or, or surrender. Okay. I kind of gave the punchline away by saying surrendering to a higher power. What, where I was going was, okay, what's the association between seeing yourself in the largest time frame and a higher power? And then also, is there something that is akin to giving up control when you yeah, look farther and farther into that. the future? That's such a great, yeah, that's right, like at the heart of what I'm very interested in because it's a real paradox, right? It's this kind of locus of control within ourselves that really in modern culture we, we think is a great thing. But when that's taken to an extreme, and one example of that is, is addictive behaviors, it's very bad for people and for communities. And so what can be what can pull people out of that is this kind of surrender to a to a higher power, giving up that locus of control, locating that locus of control outside themselves, not, not necessarily mm -hmm. like in a theistic sense. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, that they talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, is, um, you know, you don't have to believe in God. It just doesn't, it just not you. You're not, you know, you're not driving it. And so I would be very curious from the perspective of your all's understanding of active inference and the free energy principle and how the brain works. Why is it that um, sort of embracing our inability to control what happens in our lives can actually be the very source of healing, especially embedded in this really kind of over-controlled, yeah, I would even go so far as to say endemically narcissistic culture. Like, I'm really curious. I don't want to take the conversation, you know, in a direction. You please, guys. please. That's a, a fantastic question. So if anyone has a, a comment on that, please. Well, I have some thoughts. 
uh, and I think this applies um, applies both at the personal level and at the at the global level. And I think it has to do with the the my quote from earlier uh, by Edward Fulbrook that uh, if you're falling from a plane, yes, maybe an altimeter and some instruments. Uh, might be useful, but what you really need is a parachute, right? So we have this um, uh, we have this uh, presupposition that that our whatever like framing we have we have operating in our day to day is going to be okay. This this is the right framing, and it's going to it tends to be the this uh, this rational scientific uh, framing of of okay, very very linear uh, cause and consequence for 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 most stuff. And uh, it turns out that even like if you inspect our our day to day behavior, you know, bigger, more complicated models are not necessarily better, which is where we get uh, the success of heuristics under bounded computation, bounded rationality. Uh, and uh, if you scale it up to to uh, eight billion humans interacted in in a, in a resource constrained planet you know, a world of possibilities, but also of, of challenges, then you just, I mean, you have to, we have to like drastically lower our, 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 uh, our bar for, yes, how much control we have, but also even like how much, what was, where does uh, information gathering reach diminishing returns? Where does modeling reach uh, diminishing returns? Uh, there's a whole literature on uh, in the business world about the expected value of information, how much you should actually invest. Like, also in science, it's also uh, known as uh, optimal experiment design, where you're basically you know uh, acknowledging that uh, that you have a limited budget in terms of how much you can act and how much you can probe and how much you can how much time you can spend thinking about stuff. And uh, I think what we're, what we're doing when we feel like burned out or or uh, exhausted from from overthinking, uh, we're innately feeling that that okay we've we've gone too high and we need uh, we need to to uh, give ourselves a vacation, give ourselves some uh, some uh, some free time here. I think that doing this on a principle in a principled way, uh, we're just not not just like taking the heuristics and the the signals that uh, that we inherit from uh, from evolution, but actually being able to figure out. Uh, collaboratively and uh, and with with some rigor, okay. This is uh, we don't need to know exactly how much how many degrees the world is going to warm uh, by 2100 uh, in order to know that maybe it's a good idea to to start doing something about the amount of of, of carbon in the atmosphere or whatever, right? Uh, and so I think this leads to this 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 no knowledge this idea of a, of a real knowledge economy and of Things like abstraction as a service. How can you actually, um, how can you actually build in, um, build in this these kinds of like sophisticated and uh, and um, the sophisticated uh, translation layers that take some of this burden from from ourselves as individuals and even as organizations, right? Uh, and just put it out in the world as as value added services, which is what they are. And Guillaume, if you have any statements or questions or retorts, then please feel free. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, now I was still uh, also uh, thinking about the recent breakthrough post twenty twenty in active inference. Uh, to 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 me, like there were like theoretical uh, progress that were very interesting. Uh, we heard already about the the formalism maturity at the mathematical level between multi scale and scale free aspect. Um, I, I really liked also the the development of a more multi-agent perspective of active inference. It's very interesting, like uh, especially like for instance the seeing multi-agent systems. We, we just heard like like even society as a well, whole, like as many as one uh, system or many as many subsystems, and how we can uh, use maybe those formalisms to also deal with policy making. Uh, that's very interesting uh, venue, and uh, the emergence of norms, culture, and ideas are so because um, one one thing that I'm still struggling with in in the case of active inference models is like how to get outside the the checkerboard. Uh, you you can put a lot in the in the model a priori, and uh, how you make the model 
creating new stuff that is not backed inside at the first. And, and I, on that, like one very uh, interesting breakthrough was the, the application of active inference to morphogenesis. I really like the, the work that has been done on that. And on the technical aspects, I think the the two main uh, focus that I love are uh, all the deep active inference and how to scale up uh, active inference because it's a, it's a strong limitation for the adoption of the, the formalism uh, if it's not scaled enough compared to other framework like deep learning. And then um, the, the link with empirical data. I, I really like, for instance, the, the work of uh, Ryan Smith and uh, how to connect with uh, electrophysiology and clinical uh, data. And I think it's also something very important to anchor uh, the theory in, in the real world and have like a, a falsifiability and empirical validation of uh, those models. And what are some of the applications of active inference to morphogenesis? So, well, I'm, I'm not the expert here, Carl would be the, the best to answer that, but uh, I, I was referring to the, the work with Michael Levin and how a model can uh, help to create a, a sort of embryogenesis. Um, so maybe Carl, you can uh, explain better than me. Please. Yeah, I don't have a reputation for explaining things very clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, it was just at work with Michael Evan and colleagues um, uh, showing that um, you can get quite expressive and biomimetic pattern formation and movement of different cells into an organization, um, often described in terms of um, morphogenesis, um, simply by communicating your beliefs. Um, so I, I'm coming back to this sort of cross-cutting theme of, of communication. So if you just broadcast your beliefs and you're a little cell and you have and there are a little ensemble of cells and they all have the shared generative model that um, includes if I was in this position I would sense that. Now they all have exactly the same generative model, the same predictions, the same expectations um, and they're all um, broadcasting their beliefs about where they are and the free energy minimizing solution is just when they're all in a place that they such that they um, receive signals that they would expect to to um, receive when they're in this place. And of course, if that is the same for everybody, there's only one arrangement where each cell finds its place. So basically, it's just knowing your place is an emergent property of making the world mutually uh, predictable through communication. So it's a, it's a, you know, a deflationary account of morphogenesis. Um, but, but Guillaume, I thought you know, one of your um, units is precision psychiatry. So I thought you were going to talk about precision. So I'm going to do a Guillaume now. <laughs> I'm going to, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk, he, he talked about morphogenesis. I'm going to talk about precision now. That, I think there's, there's a, that's a really nice way just to pick up on themes which uh, everybody's just mentioned, and in particular the pathology of precision. Uh, and by precision, you can read precision uh, you know, in the sense that Bert was talking about in terms of do you use uh, an unsigned integer or a double? You know, how much can I coarse grain to my numeric representation? Or you can use it in terms of coarse graining in the sense of the renormalization group. You know, it's just chunking things in hours or years as opposed to milliseconds and minutes. Or you can look at it in terms of a statistician um, um, describing the reliability or the inverse variance of a signal. And of course, we have to estimate that. Um, when I say we, I mean uh, your agents and statisticians um, and act accordingly. And certainly um, in the active, in the work of Ryan Smith uh, on addiction, much of the sort of mathematical explanation for these addictive, locked in OCD like uh, uh, phenomena rests upon a failure to get that course grading that precision estimation right um and the, the reason I, I i wonder whether it'd be just worthwhile revisiting um um addiction and psychopathology or certainly pathology of behavior 
uh, from the point of view of getting precision wrong and certainly assigning too much precision to low level processing which is what Bert wants to avoid doing um, uh, it just strikes me that that kind of story also has mileage in terms of why we are in a state of paralysis when it comes to climate change because I also noticed Guillaume that you talked about climate action I've never heard that before but that seems to me to be the important thing why isn't there any climate action and Anna you know what it'll be like you going to the clinic and, and finding some of the Parkinson's disease why isn't this person moving you know <laughs> uh, and interesting the the computational explanation for Parkinson's disease is assigning too much precision to the evidence that you're not moving before you move so you know if you don't if you can't ignore the fact that nothing is changing all your prior beliefs your predictions that I'm going to stand up or I'm going to initiate walking don't get a look in because they are immediately cancelled because you've assigned too much precision to the lower level processing and I'm just wondering whether that that's something that that kind of pathology is exactly what the the, the, you know what, what what Ralph is Ralph is trying to reverse by having you know um, models at hand recommendations at hand that provide a more coarse-grained view of things a deeper view um Anna would you like to comment on that yeah well I just I love I love this idea of the pathology of precision because I think it it manifests in so many different ways um you know not just among my my patient population but i think it's almost like a like a cultural sickness in a way um you know the ways in which we we seem like obsessed with certain types of of data and we're missing the big picture so i'm going to i'm going to think more about that i'm going to read more about it uh, i really appreciate the discussion it's interesting for me and anna when you're referring to the pathology of precision do you mean so in a more conscious sense that we're over evaluating something that we don't need to whereas carl you're referring to it in an unconscious sense like the brain is putting too much precision on something because in parkinson's it's it's not like you consciously are putting precision in a place well i think you could look at it sort of like in, in both cases when i think about addiction um, you know, people aren't doing it consciously. It's that they really do um, see this as adaptive and healthy and also even on some level they can't do otherwise. And they're not able to see the true impact of their drug use on their lives. They're genuinely not able to see the negative consequences. I mean, that's, that's what contributes to getting caught in that vortex. But I mean, you could also see it as part of what's happened culturally, like for example, like the whole wellness industrial complex, the way that we now count ourselves, um, you know, through all these different devices. And if we could just count our breathing and count our heart rate and take mm. supplements, you know, then we would somehow reach some levitating state of precise wellness. And so, I, I don't know, I mean, you know, just kind of, this is all, this is all kind of new, new ideas for me. That's interesting. So you believe that we can be inundated with health data and that that's detrimental to us oh absolutely i see that all the time uh-huh so for me i used to have uh okay maybe i'll take this out of the well this is going out live okay let me be let me figure out how to say this diplomatic di diplomatically i used to have a device that would measure my heart rate let's say that and and my sleep and instead of improving my sleep it led to me becoming obsessed with it and then noticing oh i didn't sleep well I must not be feeling good today as well, because apparently there's a high connection between how you sleep right. quality that, and how well exactly you feel. That's exactly it. Plus, added to that, the other layer that I should be able to control it, right? So with, with all of this data and information, I should be able to, I don't know, reduce free entropy or whatever, how to reduce surprise, as you guys talk mm -hmm, about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that's obviously, that only goes so far and then can actually contribute to our misery because... Where why aren't we all you know levitating like the Buddha or whatever? Um, you know when we have all these tools and we can pay attention to all this data. So I see this also with people who have productivity tools. So and, and not only that, but mechanical keyboards. Let's say 
some the reason why I don't have a mechanical keyboard, even though I think I'd love it, is because I know that why the heck do I care about the clicking sound of a keyboard? But if I got one, then I'd be like, well, what's the difference between clicking sound A versus clicking sound B versus clicking sound C? And I'd become obsessed with the trappings of productivity that is sharpening, so-called sharpening the axe, rather than cutting down the, the tree. There's this phrase that is apocryphal, and it said it's attributed to, I think, Lincoln, which is that he'd spend 80% of his time or half the time sharpening the knife than cutting the tree. And when you just, if you just think, and then this is just echoed in productivity circles, but it just, it can't be the case. Why would you spend so much time sharpening your axe? Like, look at anyone who cuts down a tree with an axe. Most of the time, they're not doing that. Anyhow, so if anyone has any comments on, on what was just said, please. Can, can I uh, just talk about what I find exciting in my field about axe? Sure, sure. Yes. Um, I read... It was a long time ago, but there was a paper, um, and it, it it's about that it says, uh, well, active inference is not really a scientific loop because it's biased. And um, and I read that, and the the the, the sound of the paper was kind of so this so it's not good, but I think you know active inference is is it's maybe not a science loop, it's an engineering loop because there's bias, and we need bias in engineering. We need to make stuff. We need to build stuff. We need to have a bias. So it's an engineering design cycle. I see that everywhere around me. Um, and active inference could be um, a, a complete breakthrough in uh, in engineering, right? Um, the fields around me are signal processing. I am myself in a signal processing uh, department or group, and uh, everybody builds algorithms. For us, I mean, in active inference agents, it's inference over states. Then the floor below me, they build control systems. Well, it's inference over actions. Then other people are working on machine learning. It's inference over parameters. Active inference could be, and you'll like this, uh, Kurt, it's a very deflationary uh, view on, uh, on engineering because everything is just inference. And so rather than building algorithms everywhere if we become really good at implementing energy minimization we will we will be able to build a, a great engineering design cycles and and we'll be engineering better machines for for, for yeah, you know for medical procedures or for other things that are important so it has a tremendous uh, application potential in engineering um, in, in engineering, I think in most uh, many fields, uh, people have sort of drifted in different directions. Control theorists have, I mean, they do almost the same thing as signal processing people, but they speak a different language now. And, you, you know, so, uh, and everybody, and, and, and signal processing people, it's a completely different group from the machine learning people, but it's all information processing. And this brings it, uh, this field, can bring it together. Uh, so I think mm. it's, uh, it, it, if, but the thing is that in order to, to, to make it successful in engineering, we need to build an application that, uh, well, that impresses, right? That it's not like a tic-tac-toe thing, but that it, it really needs to uh, impress people. It needs to be better than, you know, than some other control systems. Um, but once we do that, I think there is tremendous uh, application potential because there haven't been enormous breakthroughs in signal processing and control. The last big breakthrough, I think, was Kalman filtering, and this was 1960s. And and I mean, it's it's kind of uh, it's it's kind of funny that the essence of what we do in active inference is also Kalman filtering. <laughs> so. Um, that's uh, I think there's tremendous uh, opportunities for for what we do here for uh, for engineering. So that's why Anna, it's, that's sorry. why it's exciting to me. Anna, do you mind expanding on what you said about acting and therapists should be helping their patients with that? Oh, uh, sure. J just so I mean, one of my critiques of uh, you know mental health treatment today is that there's not enough. Um, there's not enough encouragement of patients to actually go and act differently in the world as a way of gathering data. Instead, it, it often ends up being kind of this 
world building um, between therapist and patients, not, not necessarily ultimately adaptive in the world. So I was really just kind of responding to what Raph mm. was saying, that we need to act in the world. I think that's more true now um, in you know modern rich nations than ever before because we are so incredibly sedentary and interacting. Of course, we're interacting with a virtual world and that's, you know, good and bad, but I mean, I think mm -hmm. we, we need to be actually acting in the world. Mm. And so there's, there's different forms of therapy, as you, as you know, there's talk therapy, and then there's also cognitive behavioral therapy or psychotherapy instead of talk therapy. But, but cognitive behavioral therapy, as far as I understand, focuses on, on the actions. Is that incorrect or? Well, or it, it also focuses, focuses on, on model cognitions, building. on the cognitions. Uh, and, um, I mean, for, you know, again, treating addiction, like you're, you're not going to really get that far with cognitive behavioral therapy or anything that's focused on just emotions and cognitions. People have to go out and actually um, try stop using their stopping their substance or their addictive behaviors and gather data from that experience and then come back and process it. Mm -hmm. So Anna, in your field, and this question will go to everyone, but in, in your field and what you study, where is the largest gap that you would like to see closed? Well, I mean, we're facing a huge mental health crisis. Um, now we have more and more young people coming in with depression, anxiety, suicidality, addictions of all sorts. And these are not necessarily people who are struggling by virtue of trauma or socioeconomic disparity. These are people who have really privileged lives in many instances. So it's uh, it's really a puzzle, you know, what what is going on for people. And I think a, a big part of it is the fact that people are not having embodied experiences. They're not having experiences in the world. Um, and, and also the experiences that they are having are, you know, these kinds of uh, very quick fixes and um, fast pleasures. So uh, are you I, noticing, I, yeah. I think, you know, the, the, the co-created sort of models through healthier communication that allow people to feel part of a community and also to have like truthful co-created narratives, trying to use the language here. Um, I think that's really important. So, for example, one of the things Bert mentioned, what he's excited about, one of the things I'm excited about in the field of addiction medicine is mutual support and the proliferation of things like Alcoholics Anonymous, but also other mutual help, help groups, a lot of them existing now online, and the way that people are together creating healthier narratives and acted together uh, to counteract a lot of the unhealthy narratives that I think are driving a lot of decision making today. I wanted to know, is there a correlation between the rise in mental health or sorry, mental illness or mental health issues, whatever we want to call it, and and a certain trait of people? Like, is it affecting every, is it affecting the population the same? So the whole population is raised 20% in terms of how many mental health issues they have per year. Or is it affecting people who deal with abstractions more and more? So for instance, we're talking over Zoom. And some people study abstractions just like us. And then there's some people who whose work it is to to do something physical like running or or swim. Like is it affecting everyone equally? Or are you noticing that there's some broad trend? Well, the broad trends that are out there are, are just correlational, but the more time that people spend in the virtual world, the more likely they are to suffer from depression, anxiety, and other mental health problems. Um you know, people haven't really been able to narrow that down to specific content, but they have been able to say if just the sheer amount of time that spending that you're spending online increases your risk for certain mental health, you know, poor mental health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Carl, if, if well, again, if anyone has any comments or questions, please just raise your physical hand. I can see that. And <laughs> okay, Raph, Ralph, Raphael, sorry. No, I was just going to say that uh, I think another uh, notable trend is that, and I just saw somebody say this on YouTube yet just yesterday, that uh, uh, young people are disproportionately affected by things like climate grief because they're the ones that are going to be alive to deal with it. Um, and uh, I think that applies more generally that, uh, you know, Peter Senge already like 30 years or something ago uh, wrote about the inescapable network of neutrality, 
reality that that uh, that what we're, what we do affects each other, right? And uh, we built we, we we took advantage of this huge resource buffer that's called uh, the biosphere and uh, and uh, and and Earth to to pretend that it didn't for um, for quite a long time, and you know got got a lot of mileage out of it, but. Uh, now we're at a point where you know that there's there, there's a, a a whole generation of people that are coming to grips with the fact that um, I'm, I'm going to stop myself from saying a swear word, but oh my god, we need to uh, we actually need to change everything about everything about everything that we do, and uh, and we need to do it fast. And uh, and by the way, the, the, it's not just uh, what we do in. Uh, it's not just what we do out there it's also what we do inside how we get ready for for how to show up for life internally right so no, no wonder that it, that it had that impacts like my, my myself i've dealt with anxiety and uh and uh and a lot of, of of other things we've had conversations about what what are we doing bringing a daughter into this world and all these kinds of things and i think it's uh, it's only natural that that it's it's coming to a head in this way right now Neom, you have your hand up, and I can't see you. Yes. Um, yeah, it's connected with uh, what has just been said. Um, so, and your initial question about the, the gaps that needs to be closed. I, I think like uh, a scale-free model of health and mental health, particularly, would be great. Like uh, uh, we are in silos in biomedical research, and uh, the fact that someone is uh, having depression can come from uh, interacting genes as much as interacting people and uh, also uh, is related to climate change and so on. So how we can have a, a new health systems that doesn't deal with those silos and integrate those different scales to me, it's like really uh, a big challenge, but uh, a challenge that uh, current models and work that we can see uh, go in that direction. And I'm very enthusiastic about that. Bert. Um, yeah, the, um, well, I, I, in, in my field in engineering, active influence is not understood um, because almost all papers are written by, by neuroscientists and they're hard to read. So I was really uh, happy to hear today that and I think it's Sanjeev uh, Namjoshi who, who is writing a, an engineering book on active inference. So that will, I think that will really help. Um, that together with the availability of good toolboxes for implementing active inference should make a lot of engineers uh, much more enthusiastic about uh, active inference because that's, uh, it's not something that is, uh, and it's not understood at the moment in uh, in engineering circles. So I hope that uh, yeah, the book will be good. Uh, that I'm enthusiastic about that. And Carl, where where are some gaps in the in your research that you'd like to see addressed? Um, oh well, there are more than gaps. There's a whole empty space out there yet to be. Um explored um but in terms of um in in terms of what seems to be emerging from um the session and specifically the past few um answers it it does seem to be um important to have um this very generic just to take bert's um sort of line that this is just one deflationary simple and probably the right way to understand stuff and to make recommendations or to um, uh, describe uh, people's actions possibly to themselves in a therapeutic uh, context um, and as such it should be push button technology uh, and it should be democratized and socialized and um, I, I think that's the challenge practically um, and one, one may ask why would you want to do that um, for me, the, the, there are two um, clear imperatives. Um, one is um, very abstract, and, and it's not really my uh, um, within my comfort zone. And the other one is in my comfort zone. But the one that's outside my comfort zone is, um, 
is um, this notion of um, interactivity and hyperconnectivity in the and, and the meta crisis that we we heard about. Um, and um and Aguim also referred to this in terms of what he was trying he was trying to distinguish between a, a Californian notion of optimality and another kind another way forward um and to me it's 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 you know a stark contrast with growth is good versus sustainability uh, and of course the mass of the free energy principle is just about sustainability it's just a description of the physics of systems random dynamical systems that self-organize to some non-equilibrium steady state and that is what we are um so you know for me there's something deeply uh, if you like apt about the free energy principle and its corollaries such as active inference in application to ecosystems and lived ecosystems and realized ecosystems um so if that if those basic principles can be brought back um into globalization uh into the you know into the market into fintech into um social media into politics into you know climate action i think that would be a good thing um i'm just mindful of, you know this struck me in a number of the, uh, the presentations today um if you remember before bert was saying if you look at the brain which is a you know a really lovely example of a self-organizing system to a non-equilibrium steady state um then it's empty and what did he mean by that well he didn't mean you're empty-headed <laughs> what he meant was it's incredibly sparsely connected now that tells you immediately that a pathology of connectivity is hyper connectivity over connectivity which immediately um well um, it made me very alert to um the presentation of the meta crisis that one of the first three things that was uh, and underwrote the, the the meta crisis or you know the current crisis where we're, we're uh, contending with is a destruction of that sparse delicate connectivity that defines thingness and defines ensembles of things technically in terms of Markov blankets. So if we want a world in which lots of different things can coexist in some kind of generalized synchrony in a sustainable way, mm -hmm. you need sparse connectivity. And the pathology, the thing that will destroy that is overconnectivity. Um, so it seems to be very important that we get that into uh, into play in terms of uh, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, politics, fintech, climate change. And the only way it's going to get there is, is epistemically by uh, equipping people to actually um, build their own little models and ask their own questions. You can't tell people this. They've got to learn and they've got to learn it for themselves. Uh, just very quickly, because I'm sure we, yeah, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the other agenda, which I'm more familiar with, is, is exactly Anna's and, and, and Guillaume's agenda, which is uh, making this work in the context of, uh, um, of neurology and psychiatry. Um, so if you can democratize um, and socialize this way of describing things so that people can now build models of their particular patient in the other use of precision psychiatry um that i suspect that Guillaume's uh, unit was uh, called after um so to personalize medicine that is really personalized in the sense that it, it, it you know you actually have your digital twin of the of your behavior and then you've got that you know you optimize your digital twin to become a model of your patient and then you can start to do experiments on that on that model behavioral interventions or even share that model very much in the spirit of cbt with the patient and say look this is you this is what would happen if you went out and did this and this is what would happen if you went out and did that um you know that that to, to my mind and indeed that was the initial motivation for much of this work was actually to build um observation models of psychiatric conditions to work out both the um the the, the pharmacological and physiological basis and the disruption of the overly the, the pathology of precision and message passing on the factographs that are our brain even though they are very empty on the one hand but also get that behavior that that, that key thing that anna was talking about the active engagement with the lived world uh into the, into that model and hence active inference and just to conclude you know um that 
that, that that activity that sort of physical engagement that embodiment that sort of um four e's and everything else um i think it's really coming to a head now in terms of people's um you know after the large language model after the chat gpt moment people the, the bounce back uh, has been what's missing you know what's not there and of course what is not there is agency and embodied engagement with the world um and that's why i think there's still there's still a lot of work to be done you know in bringing artificial intelligence read as active inference to mm. in a way that matters to people who you know who, you know the people who can, can make a difference which is basically everybody but specifically politicians and doctors and the engineers and the like mm. So you all now have 30 seconds to 60 seconds to speak directly to the audience. What is the message that you, what closing message do you have? You're speaking directly to someone who's listening. They're a curious person. They're interested in active inference. They also want to lead better lives, hopefully, and, 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 and do something propitious. So what message do you have for them? Anna, we'll start with you. Gosh, um, I'm just going to say what pops into my mind right now is that one of the things I have learned from my patients who are trying to get into recovery from severe addictions is something that they call the set aside prayer, where they set aside all of the notions that they have about how the world works and try to be completely open and receptive to information coming into their minds. And I think that's just a wonderful, um, a wonderful frame or concept for all of us uh, living in the world um, to periodically just take a moment and take these models and just say, you know, everything I think I know about the world, I'm going to temporarily suspend it and I'm just going to be open. And when that happens, we can be um, present and learn in a way that it's not possible when we're just trying to reinforce our models. Great, fantastic. And Bert, and then we'll go Carl, and then Raf, and then Guillaume. Um, well, I, I just enjoyed uh, today very much. I thought there was uh, there, there was a lot of material both for people from, let's say, psychology, neuroscience, but also from for engineers. So if you haven't watched some of the talks, go 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 look through the schedule because some of the talks were really good. I think so. I really enjoyed that. Um, and then, yeah, what should I tell people? Um, go work out. Do uh, do a lot of sports. It's good for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was going to make a joke, but I can't because it wouldn't be mm -hmm. um, So I'm going to use my thirty second uh, just to to thank. Uh, daniel and his team for for, for this um you know so if you want something to do um you should go and watch the live streams um and um get involved with this ecosystem i hadn't seen that paper being presented before but i was really impressed with you know with, with the sort of the active influence institute and its openness and its uh, you know welcoming um um attitude and vision like the smithsonian um so if you want to pursue these ideas get involved and if you uh, haven't got time just make sure you attend next year's active inference institute uh, celebration but thank you daniel Raphael. yeah so uh, i'll second what uh, what carl said and follow on with uh it's it's an invitation not just uh, to participate in the in the active Inference institute but also an invitation to participate in uh, building this uh, this Gaia tractor, this uh, this new way of 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 doing things that uh, acknowledges the value of growth uh, and also the value of sustainability, joins it all together in this thing called regeneration, and uh, it really is uh, it really is a collective effort, a collective learning effort. So. Um, so, and this also, by the way, also applies to to the the, the panelists as well. And I think uh, obviously what uh, Bert and uh, Carl are doing it has immediate uh, things having that have to do with with uh, what we're, up, we're after. But one of the main things that that we discussed that we keep discussing is also like this uh, the inter 
intersubjectivity and uh, the importance of, of being able to operate well as humans together, and that connects directly to cognitive science, psychiatry, uh, and so Guillaume on Anna, uh, and uh, and yeah, so everybody that wants to 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 be engaged and uh, and be a part of building a better world should be thinking about how do I how, how what am I doing with my as an individual or as a as an employee of an organization or as a researcher or as a leader uh, or the family member what am I doing uh, how does it contribute to to this uh, this new this new non steady non not equilibrium set of state. So yeah, that's that's kind of it. I probably blew through the 60 seconds, but here it is. <laughs> and Guillaume. Well, uh, I would thanks also uh, all of you for the discussion and uh, the, the organizer uh, for what they are doing. Indeed, like the the work uh, of the Active Inference Institute is very uh, laudable and interesting from an open science perspective. They are really uh, embodying that. So uh, big kudos to them. And uh, well, uh, Bert de Fries was saying like uh, to do sport is good for you. I'm not very good at sports, but uh, mm -hmm. some say that science is a team sport. So uh, at least uh, have a, a good uh, team perspective when doing science and being kind to each other would be the best advice to to everyone. Well, thank you and all. Kurt. I also would like to. You get <laughs> you get yours too. Somebody else has to come in from outside the Markov blanket, though. Well, I wanted to just thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel and and Raphael, I, and well, and also Carl and Anna and Bert and Guillaume. This was a tremendous amount of fun, and well, I hope I get to speak to you all individually. And for I, I as usual, I have way more questions than we were able to get to. Thank you all. Thanks, Kurt. Exciting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Farewell Thanks. to the panelists. You're all welcome back anytime. Um, thanks everybody for watching or re-watching. Right now we're about to head over to the Discord and hang out and talk a little more if you want to, and then stay involved, get involved. So till next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.